So we are here again for session 33 of our commentary on the Gospel of Mark. And I think, like I said um, last time, uh, things start picking up um, if they haven't already picked up uh, shortly with chapter 9, probably. Even now, it's like a, we're going to reach the structural mid midpoint of uh, Mark, according to some scholars, and that would be Peter's confession, the Markan version of uh, what Peter says uh, Jesus is. But first, um, after we discussed uh, a bit the uh, asking for a sign, uh, the Pharisees uh, are always putting Jesus to the test, uh, asking for credentials, uh, whether that exactly is historical or not, um, I don't know. I know, know that in the temple incident, when they ask him with what translation authority you do this, when Jesus throws out the money changers, etc., um, this exousia word, uh, with what right, or if we, we were to be consistently translating the, the uh, word from Daniel 7, dominion, or in Latin, potestas, which, with what plenty potentiary authority and power do you do this? And, um, you know, it could, could have been just like that. In, in Mark, in John, of course, he, Jesus prefers, and, and the gospel writer prefers to speak of signs, uh, and but uses the word exousia se several times. For example, Jesus has exousia to give his life and take it up again in, in John 10. But uh, here uh, we, 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 we saw briefly that uh, in Mark it says, no sign will be given to you. And that is followed by this uh, discussion on the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So again, in Mark, uh, you have this, you know, I call it strange bedfellows of some sort of alliance between Pharisees and Herodians. Uh, we saw that in chapter 3 when he heals the paralytic. From that early on, these two groups... Uh, decide to that Jesus must die, and so uh, you could um, consider these people as representatives of both the religious authorities or powerful people and the political ones. He rarely attacks Romans directly, or at least Mark doesn't. I don't think Jesus was a hothead political activist either, but. Um, Certainly, it's all kept within uh, Judaism. And, and if we looked at the episode of uh, these people that Jesus uh, criticizes for uh, banquets and the first seats in the synagogues, etc., in chapter 12, for remember, Herod uh, has or is going to have this banquet. Uh, where Salome dances, etc., the daughter of Herodias. And of course, the Pharisees would be the ones to prolong their phylacteries and religious vestments, etc. And this talk of leaven, which of course in Judaism is, is, is something of an impurity to be removed in Passover. You have that famous line in Paul, uh, make sure you remove all uh, leaven from your midst because Christ our Passover has been sacrificed the Passover lamb if you will and so um, leaven is is something that causes putrefaction if you will rotting of some sort fermentation has to do with this rotting I remember John Belushi had a movie I think the noble rot regarding the grapes to throw something uh, there from uh, John Belushi, but um, you certainly, uh, and he talks about uh, 
uh, unleavened bread of purity and truth. Isn't that interesting? This is I'm looking at 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 8. So that it's interesting to see that leaven is the opposite of purity and truth. And, and here Jesus is... Uh, telling them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And we could say, beware of the fake news, if you will. Beware of the falsehoods that are perpetrated and the impurity in the sense of corruption, corrupt uh, behavior, corrupt uh, motives, manipulation, lying for political and economic purposes. There you have, in a nutshell, our whole predicament today in the middle of this coronavirus. And uh, But they were thinking of the bread. This is kind of like Johannine. They're thinking materially. He's saying we don't have any bread, etc. Um, you know, uh, and so Jesus, uh, aware of this, uh, says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Um, and there's a, something reminiscent here of Isaiah, um, having ears you don't, or eyes you don't see and ears you don't hear. But it's actually, my Jerusalem Bible is indicating Jeremiah 5.21 and Ezekiel 12.2. But it's certainly very similar to the mission of Isaiah, which is used often in the New Testament, including Mark, and at the end of Acts, for example. This mission of Isaiah, his call, chapter 6 of Isaiah, it's a mission doomed to failure, mission impossible. Uh, go and talk to these people, but hearten their hearts and, and, and dull their ears, etc., lest they turn and be converted. It's kind of a, something that has to be parsed and explained, but it's really sort of the recognition that the hearers of Isaiah, maybe in hindsight, maybe from the beginning, are not going to, uh, in general, accept his message. And therefore, you have this uh, coda or uh, ending in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah says, Ad mata, until when, Lord? And the Lord says, until the cities are empty and remain without inhabitants and the houses without men and the countryside desolated. And so it's a very strong punishment. And I, I look at our crises not as, as divine punishment that God out there has some sort of a, um, you know, Xbox or whatever it is, playing games with people is going to zap them. But the very structure of the world and our, the very structure of our life and how we grow old and, and sick is a call to rely on God rather than our, on our human uh, resources only. Spanish, we have the famous saying, a Dios rogando y con el mazo dando, uh, praying to God on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, working uh, with your, you know, sickle or whatever it is that you need to be hammering or something. So that um, I would say that we are called to understand uh, the condition of the world and how bad things have gotten. I, I pray more for our conversion than the just getting rid of this plague, because we have other plagues. The Pope has, has, has said it, the plague of uh, egotism, self-absorption, distraction, having dull ears, not paying attention, not having mindfulness, this wonderful Buddhist uh, concept. And so um, we're thinking about the bread, and in fact, there are more serious things to uh, understand. So moving right along here, 
Uh, we have this episode of the healing of a blind man in Bethsaida. And uh, they, it says, my Bible here says, they presented a blind man and begged him to touch him. And so again, you have this spit, use of spit, very earthy, laid his hands on him. And this man sees gradually. He doesn't see all at once, which when we think about this love of and penchant of Mark for Euthus immediately stayed away, he went there straight away, he did this straight away, he did that. Here you have an example of no straight away, no immediately, but gradually. Very interesting at the structural midpoint so that he eventually sees things clearly but um, it takes a process. And many scholars, I think, uh, say that this is related to Peter's intuition, wherein he confesses Jesus as the Messiah, in Greek, the Christ, without elaboration, not the Son of the living God or the Christ of God, like in Luke, or the Holy One of God in, in John 6, which the demon in Mark 1 says you are the Holy One of God. But here, I think you have a historical confession, explicitation, if you will, that the disciples are following Jesus because they think he's the Messiah. But if you followed all the messianic models, you know, like when they we have hurricanes and they have models, all the mess, no messianic model really had a suffering Messiah. And what you have here, uh, you have Jesus speaking of the Son of Man must suffer many things. Now this is already a combination. The Son of Man is in Daniel 7 is not explicitly the Messiah. In the Jewish tradition he will be, uh, when the thrones are set up, a uh, one for uh, one is going to be for uh, the Ancient of Days, God, and the other one for David. But the Son of Man is combined with Messiah in, the, in first Enoch. As with the Chosen One of Isaiah, but not so much as a suffering Chosen One, but rather as uh, a teacher and, and, and just a triumphant. The Messiah was supposed to break the heads of the enemy. Psalm 2 and other places, so that they thought Jesus with his fulfilling of messianic passages in Isaiah 34, 35, the blind seeing and the lame walking and all these things, he's the Messiah. That's what Nathaniel in John chapter 1 uh, says he is, because he's been reading, etc., and Jesus knows what he's been reading, but the, the, the scale, the, the ladder of Jacob and all this kind of stuff. But... Um, Peter, when, when, when he hears Jesus talk about the Son of Man, which clearly in this gospel and probably in Jesus' language himself, read Daniel Boyarin, the Jewish Gospels, which is amazing, by a Talmudic scholar, Boyarin, B-O-Y-A-R-I-N, the Jewish Gospels. Um, the Son of Man was a very high title. That's what Jesus talks about in the trial, too. And Peter understanding this, says, you must never suffer. And Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan, because you are thinking in human terms, not uh, in divine uh, vision terms. And if you look at uh, what Jesus says to him, he says, hipage opiso mu, go behind me, and it's not get away from me, Satan, but rather uh, it, this is to be understood with what follows. If anyone wants to uh, go behind me, a tistele o piso mu um carry your own cross, carry your cross and follow me. It's not, Peter, get away from me, you're Satan, but rather you're acting like a Satan, an adversary, an obstacle, a scandal, a stumbling stone. Diabolos would be, the Greek version would be somebody that gets in the way. Satan would be the accuser, the, the uh, devil's advocate, etc. 
dissuade her from the right way, uh, Jesus is, is saying, go behind me. That's what Peter is exhorted to do. And so then you have language here, very interesting in Mark, uh, the earliest gospel, son of man coming with the glory of, the, of his father with the holy angels, reminds you of the judgment in Matthew 25 with the son of man in his glory, straight from Enoch, or Enoch is straight from Matthew at, at that point. Very, very interesting. We'll have to stop there.